the window just blew in, but it just blew me straight out the door. The wall had just been totally taken out. I was looking straight over my next door neighbor's house. To me, the airplane is out of control, and so I thought, this is it, it's all over. Down here on the ground, it's a little bit breezy, but six miles up at over 30,000 feet, the winds can be powerful and chaotic. Now, a lot of air turbulence is completely predictable. The radar can spot it, and the pilots radio to each other to say where the hotspots are. But there's one thing that they just can't see. It's called clear air turbulence. It can strike on any route without warning. It's absolutely terrifying, and it can kill. We've all felt the normal bumps and jolts as our holiday jet climbs through the clouds to its cruising height above the weather. But clear air turbulence is not obvious until you hit it. This is the moment that a Honolulu-bound 747 went out of control over the Pacific. The nightmare hit as supper finished and the cabin crew were clearing away. I had just finished the section I was in and was putting away my beverage cart when all of a sudden I felt my knees start to, I just kind of dropped a little and then everything just seemed to go wild. To me, the airplane was terribly out of control and so I thought, this is it, it's all over. The pilots fought to regain control as the aircraft seesawed and then fell a thousand feet. Their radar had picked up nothing. Pat McGee has 30,000 flying hours behind him, first in Alaska and now in Honolulu. He's been through turbulence many times. I have flown for 40-some years and a lot of hard flying, but nothing wears you out as much as turbulence. And Pat comes up against lots of that just 2,000 feet up, where he does most of his flying. Now, turbulence here is caused by the wind eddying around and over mountains, leaving invisible whirlpools of air for him to battle against. An aircraft needs smooth air to keep control. The uh, wing is formed in such a manner to create high pressure on the bottom of the wing and an area of low pressure on top of the wing. So this allows the wing to rise and let the airplane fly. Now we get, we throw turbulence into there, and one wing goes up, the other wing goes down. This whole ratio of low pressure area is disturbed. And up at 30,000 feet, that's what had happened to the jumbo jet, flipping up the tail, and with it, Diane. I looked down, and my blouse underneath my serving jacket was entirely red. It's a white blouse normally, and it was entirely red, so I knew that I'd been injured. My face had gone into that plastic panel with the fluorescent light tubes, and I had broken it all. My second conscious thought was, oh, I think this plane is going to survive. If it can survive, I can survive, if I can just find something to hang on to. This supercomputer simulation from the George Washington University reproduces the terrifying moment when turbulence strikes. One passenger has kept the seatbelt on, the other hasn't. As the plane turned back to Tokyo, one passenger lay dying and scores had been injured. Over the Pacific, there couldn't be invisible waves of wind above a mountain, so the hunt began for what had caused a tragedy. Earlier, we looked at the satellite imagery showing potential areas of turbulence. Forecasters at the National Weather Service in Honolulu are grappling with the challenge thrown up by a weather phenomenon that doesn't show up on instruments. One likely culprit was wind shear. Now, that happens when two layers of wind blow at different speeds. If the difference is big enough, just going from one layer to the other can make a jet bounce like a seaplane touching down. You see the breaking waves on the water surface. You have breaking waves of air above the surface, and those breaking waves create turbulence. You see a strong jet stream associated with... Tom Hefner is the warning coordination meteorologist for the Northern Pacific. It's his job to pinpoint where turbulence is most likely to occur so that high-flying jets can avoid it. At cruising altitudes in clear air, the aircraft is encountering areas where the wind speed or direction is changing rapidly. And that causes the aircraft to jolt, sometimes uncontrollably. 
Any sign of turbulence like that beginning to appear would have been radioed back by aircraft ahead of the Honolulu flight. But they'd noticed nothing. This was one of the rare occasions when a loss of control hit without warning. As the stunned holidaymakers returned to Tokyo, it became clear that those with their seatbelts on had suffered least. Unrestrained passengers and the standing flight attendants had been the worst hit. A fleet of ambulances was waiting back in Japan. It took stretcher cases first, and then the walking wounded, amongst them Diane. A veteran of millions of air miles, she carries the scars to back her advice. Should the seatbelt sign go on, don't take that time to decide you need to go to the restroom. Wait until the sign is off, because that is the best educated guess the pilots have that there isn't going to be any problem for the next while anyway. It looks like a war zone, doesn't it? But it's not. This used to be a house that belonged to a woman called Raquel, until her home, along with countless others, was smashed by the most destructive hurricane ever recorded. For a week in 1998, this storm embraced Honduras. It leveled towns and utterly changed the landscape. When it was over, maps were useless, and hundreds of thousands of people were without homes. This is the story of Hurricane Mitch. Officially, it was Tropical Storm Mitch that did this to Honduras. By then, the wind wasn't strong enough to count as a hurricane anymore. But nobody worried about the wind. It was Mitch's incredible rain that devastated Central America. The storm had been the 13th to be given hurricane status that year, and Honduras braced itself for a direct hit. A hundred miles offshore, Mitch slowed and the winds weakened. But they didn't stop carrying millions of tons of rain hundreds of miles inland from the Caribbean Sea. On the first day, people in the Honduran capital, Tegucigalpa, were worried by the rising water of the river Choluteca, but not as worried as they might have been had they known that this was about to become a disaster of biblical proportions. Marlon Madiaraga lived on one of the houses next to the river. He was quicker to react than most people. He saw the danger, and he went looking for neighbors who might be trapped in houses that backed onto the river. As the water rose, panic set in. The Choliteca had never been so high. It was getting higher, and most people did not know where to turn. We came out of the house, and the water was coming over here. It was rising all the time. I started to wade through it until I got across the street. The water was up to here on me and I was ringing the bell, but there was no answer. Then I started knocking. Inside the house was an elderly woman. Outside, what normally was a trickle, had turned into a raging flood. Panic set in. Some people began saving furniture instead of fleeing to the high ground. Meanwhile, time was running out for Marlon and the old woman, who was in no hurry to get out. When at last she answered Marlon's frantic knocking, she climbed onto his back. That's Marlon in the distance, struggling against the strength of the current. But they weren't safe yet. All the time, the water was rising. I was slipping. I was exhausted. My nerves were shot. But we managed to make it and grab hold of this post. The old lady was lucky. Moments later, the house that she'd left was full to the rafters as the overflowing river began to find its own escape route into the street. On that terrible day, Marlon ferried seven families to safety. He was a hero, but he didn't feel like one. It was as if it wasn't me. The way I see it, it seemed like it was somebody else. I wasn't myself. At the top of the street, Marlon's bemused friends and neighbors now look down at a drowning city. Take a look at this. It's a normal view of Tegucigalpa. This is the same view, taken as the flood claimed the city. The Choluteca River had rarely been more than a trickle through Tegucigalpa for over a century. But as the rain hammered down, hour after hour, whole towns were being washed away across the country. Those on the rooftops thought they were lucky, but rescue was to be weeks away. Three days passed, and still the water poured down from the hills. 
First, torrents washed away the natural barriers, and then they smashed down man-made structures. Across Honduras, the bridges were being lost. Back in Tegucigalpa, the flood had grown implacably. Under this wave is one of the city's main road bridges. The pictures reached television screens around the world, and people overseas began to understand the sheer scale of Mitch. Half the planet watched, horror-stricken, as this family lost their home, with them still inside. After the break, surviving the landslide. Hurricane Mitch was drowning Honduras. Towns had been washed away, bridges lay in ruins, rivers had swollen to ten times their usual size, and yet time and time again, people cheated death. In the Honduran capital, Tegucigalpa, there's a suburb called Nueva Esperanza, which means New Hope. Raquel Garcia built her blue house by the Choluteca, which she remembers as a gentle river. It was beautiful. We used to go there to do the washing and have a bath. Everybody used to go because it was so nice. There were pools to bathe in, but now it's no use to anyone because the water is dirty. That ruined riverbed is the legacy of Mitch, a monster that brought an entire meter of rain in one weekend. When the water came down, it came down really quickly, as if the earth was gulping it down. That day was unbelievable. High above Raquel's submerged home, one family thought their hilltop was a refuge from the flood. But days of non-stop rain had saturated the hills, weakening the earth. Bit by bit, the hillside began to fall. It was half past one in the morning when it happened. The whole bank went down at once. When the hill started to collapse, I saw a ball, a blaze of fire as if the water was boiling. I thought it was the end of the world, and that was it. High above Raquel, Julian's wife and two of their children leapt to safety. As the earth beneath their home began to slip, he was still trapped inside with their youngest boy. I was asleep. I felt the hill rumble. I heard that noise. God Almighty, I said, please let my kids be saved. I don't care if I die, just save my children because my son is very small. Please, God, save my son. And I grabbed him in my arms, and it was then that we were swept down. Ninety houses were swept into the flood water. Julian and his son survived, but 17 bodies were pulled from the mud. Watching his country's tragedy unfold was Honduras' chief mapmaker. When we saw the swollen rivers on television, and the way they changed course, and the collapsing buildings, especially what we were seeing locally in Tegucigalpa, well, that really affected us. Dr. Pineda had no doubt that the catastrophe at Nueva Esperanza was the effect of days of unprecedented rainfall, coupled with the scouring effect of the bend in the river. Putting his emotions to one side, the mapmaker began to consider how his country's ruin would affect him and his team. The bridge on the Choluteca River is a good example of how the face of the country has changed. Once upon a time, the river flowed under this bridge. It joined two sides of a valley. But the scene today reveals that the river has carved a new course. It now flows around the bridge. It was stronger than the land that it was built on, and scenes like this have turned the map of Honduras into a guessing game. Dr. Pineda's job now is to photograph every square kilometer of his country from the air, compare it with the old maps of Honduras, and then print new ones. In many cases, these rivers changed course so radically that even the borders with neighboring countries were affected. We have to verify these changes on the ground and then incorporate them into the new maps. Back at the Geographic Institute, they're working round the clock to redraw the country's maps. 
As each riverbed's new course is painstakingly traced, Mitch is remembered as the hurricane that literally changed the shape of a country. Today, in the now dry riverbed of the Choluteca, sand washed down from Nueva Esperanza has provided Raquel's family with a new living. On the road above her broken home, she sieves and sells the sand to others rebuilding Honduras. And that's going to be a long job. In the case of the Huracan Mitch, it's Hurricane Mitch was something totally extraordinary. Many people, even the scientists, were left utterly bemused by this amazing phenomenon. Honduras was left with 6,000 dead, and 8,000 are still missing. There has never been a hurricane so deadly. The English Channel has many moods, and late one winter's night, it was particularly grouchy. The people of Celsi Bill were going to bed after a day of storms, but things were suddenly about to get much worse. The waves that lash the south coast carry the memory of violent storms far out in the Atlantic Ocean. They can also hold the promise of a much rarer fury yet to come, the elusive but increasingly common British tornado. This country may not be famous for its twisters, yet more than 30 are reported each year. The Birmingham tornado of summer 99 is amongst the few to be actually caught on camera. Damage is rare, but January 1998 was to be an exception. First, this funnel cloud touched down on the Isle of Wight, and then just three days later, the same weather system produced another tornado. And that one would give the residents of Selsey a night to remember. They've been fighting the elements in this West Sussex town as long as anybody can remember. Every day, the sea eats away Celsius Shingle Beach, and every day, an army of bulldozers builds them up again. If they didn't, the town would be washed into the channel. It's a lifetime struggle for the drivers, who are philosophical in the face of nature's unrelenting persistence. We do succeed sometimes, but I mean, once you get a rough tide or rough wind, it just goes again, that's it. The power of the water, I mean, it's just unbelievable. It just takes it straight away. ITV weatherman Martin Davis would love to witness nature's energy live, but he'll never be in the right place at the right time. Our tornadoes are just too small to forecast. Although, of course, Martin can tell us what has happened after the event. When Malcolm started his shift at around 10 o'clock in the evening, there was an area of low pressure that covered thousands of miles. There were gales that were blowing all across the Atlantic towards Britain. But really, down in Selsey, it looked like pretty much any other wet and windy evening. Nothing unusual at all. But the waves were getting higher and Malcolm was in for a tough night's work. Just how tough, he could barely imagine. Nobody knew this yet, but those Atlantic gales were a prelude to the wildest wind on Earth. 10 o'clock, I think it was, we started, and it was a little bit of thunder then, and a bit of lightning, and then, so as the evening sort of progressed, the thunder and lightning sort of got worse and worse. In a house behind the Shingle Beach, Jeremy Wern was off to bed. I went into the bedroom and decided to settle down for the night. And for some unknown reason, I, um, I left the light on and, and shut the door. Um, I, it's something I don't, don't often do, but I just did it and off I toddled to sleep. Jeremy probably felt quite safe going to bed because it was just another wet and windy night. Of course, it was events that happened between 10 and midnight that really made things take a dramatic turn for the worse. I was just terrified, really. I mean, I've never known nothing like it. For once, it wasn't the power of the sea that preoccupied Malcolm, it was the strength of the wind. He couldn't see it in the pitch dark, but the Celsi tornado had begun. It starts off like a, a Swiss roll of air rotating in the horizontal ahead of the cloud like this, and it's that that begins the turning motion of the vertical spinning action that we know a tornado is. So that's when the winds really start to pick up and produce those damaging gusts. The tornado lasts for, well, a minute or less perhaps on this occasion, and it's a tiny event cutting a swathe like a razor blade really through Celsius, a very small event indeed, and you're very, very unlucky if you happen to be in its path. Malcolm and his bulldozer were the first to run out of luck. The wind just blew in, and there was glass and everything flowing about there. Of course, I opened the door to get out, and it just blew me straight out the door. After dumping Malcolm on the beach, the tornado next picked on Jeremy. I just di dived under the duvet with my head under and held it down tight. Um, purely out of self-preservation, knowing full well that what was going to happen next was not something that I could do anything about. 
so I cowered. And I put my head over the covers. I was looking straight out over my next door neighbour's house. The wall had just been totally taken out. Um, the tornado had come in through the window and just gone straight out through the wall. Jeremy's wife, Donna, out of town on business, got a bigger shock when she tuned in to the breakfast news. Good morning, it's been revealed that up to 30... First thing I saw was our wallpaper, and the next thing I saw was Naomi's toy crib swinging in the wind. Um, I can remember sitting on the end of the bed, um, totally aghast and looking into the image on the screen and realising that a house had been completely devastated and no sign of Jeremy anywhere. Jeremy was safe, but it might have been a different story. In America, they know that closing the bedroom door can cost you your life. The advice there is to open doors and windows when a whirlwind threatens. That helps to equalize air pressure both inside and out. What happens with a tornado is the air pressure outside the house falls away rapidly. And so the air inside the house is desperately trying to get out. And it does that by either lifting the roof or popping a wall out. So there was no great gust of wind, no gale force wind that came through the house. Nothing to blow the glasses off the table. The damage was done by this air trying to escape the house like, a, like a, an overinflated balloon. Crashing through house after house, the tornado left a two mile trail of destruction. The local fire brigade took 1,000 calls in less than one hour. But the man who most wanted to be there had missed out again. I lived just down the road from Selsey, and I'd really liked to have been there to see Jeremy uh, carrying under his duvet, to see the forces of nature at work, because they are, as we've seen now in these pictures, quite devastating. Jeremy won't believe me, Malcolm perhaps not either, but it was a pretty small tornado, I think, by the scale of things. Well, I don't want to see a, a stronger one, thank you. That was, um, that was quite strong enough. A tornado's a tornado, whether it's a, a weak one or a strong one, it still does the damage and it's still enough to, to frighten anybody. It did frighten me, I must admit. But Malcolm's still out there, protecting Selsey from nature's perpetual onslaught. He'll never forget the night that he was blown out of his cab by a tornado, but life and his never-ending battle with the sea goes on. Well, here's a thought to finish with. Sometimes really atrocious weather comes in the nick of time. At the Brisbane Test Match in 1998, England's cricketers were saved by a sudden cloudburst. Rain had stopped play. But there's rain stopping play, and there's Queensland rain stopping play. I'll see you again soon. Bye. We must go back to the weather. I mean, this is... It, it, it's now... We, we can... You hear that? I mean, I mean... <laughs> We've got the father and mother of tropical storms here. Down on the right-hand side, there are great long pools of water inside the boundary rope, and the rain is sweeping in great drifts across the ground. It's double wipers weather, isn't it? Oh, <laughs> golly, yes, it is. But I wouldn't have missed this for the world. Anyway, um, what else can we talk about now? <laughs> When your island is only six feet higher than the sea and the waves are about to peak at 30 feet, there's nowhere to hide. In next week's Eye of the Storm, lost and adrift on the world's biggest ocean. For a booklet containing more information about the series, send a £1.50...